going forward, I want to have a few opening remarks for this webinar. It's strictly two hours and want uh, to concentrate on it. And then uh, after, the, after the end of the, of the session, we are going to send homework to all participants and the relevant BAs, business advisors of the ADC in the different regions are going to be following up on those home exercises. And this work is going to be submitted not later than uh, Thursday, not later than Friday morning, so that it can be compiled and we can do a recap on it. We can do a recap on it when uh, we, we join in the next, the following week on Tuesday. So allow me at this juncture to welcome Yos, our lead consultant, to start the session for today. Good morning. Good morning, Yos. Everybody. I hope this will be useful, uh, what we're going to discuss uh, today. And uh, the exercise will show to what extent you, you capture what we're trying to uh, get across. Um, let me share my uh, screen with you. Can everybody see it now? Yes, seeing. Okay, let's start then. This is a uh, webinar in a series of uh, three today. We talk about the perspectives of the new harvest, uh, how we look back at what uh, happened last year and what we can expect in, in the future for, to, for, to, to start uh, planning our uh, harvest season. So first we're gonna talk about supply and demand. Um, just uh, recapturing a little bit uh, what we're talking about. Uh, coffee uh, production has increased from uh, 1995 million bags 30 years ago to between 165 and 170 million bags nowadays. Even we got at certain moments at 175 million, which means a yearly growth of 2% on, on average. Uh, that's, that's, sorry, that's consumption. Production has grown in the same proportion, more or less, but the fluctuations are much stronger. There are differences of up to 8 million bags on average between a low harvest and a high harvest. Yeah. That's for why uh, the supply side is much more important to determine what the price will do than the, the demand side. Yeah. Now, production is increasingly uh, concentrated in just a few countries, and in particular in Brazil and Vietnam 30 years ago, these two uh, countries represented 30% of total production worldwide. Nowadays, it's 55%. This is based on technology and productivity. They uh, increased their uh, productivity by more than two, yeah, more than 100%. And the rest of the world has stagnated, so they're becoming more and more important. The fluctuation between two crops in Brazil is on average eight and a half million bags over the last uh, 20 years against just 2 million bags in Vietnam. Although in Vietnam, climate change is also gaining some weight. So we see more uh, instability there. But these, most of all, Brazil, because of these uh, huge fluctuations, which determines wh where the world market price is going. You never know exactly how much Brazil is going to uh, produce. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more on that. And then there are some other countries with uh, some weight globally, which are Colombia in Washington Arabica and Indonesia in Robusta, which is the third uh, uh, producer country in volume after uh, Vietnam and Brazil in Robusta. But these uh, two countries don't really influence that much uh, the world market price. Their influence is more on the level of uh, differentials. If there's a scarcity of uh, washed Arabica, 
then differentials will, will go up. Yes. Now, if you look at uh, the, the evolution of production of these uh, four main uh, producer countries, you can easily see that Brazil, apart from the fact that it is the largest volume uh, of, of all these countries, the fluctuations between an up year and a low year are enormous. Yeah. No, there is already a kind of biannual fluctuation in a permanent crop like, like uh, Arabica. But on top of that, we've got influences of droughts. Sometimes there is a frost and you can immediately see uh, the, the impact there. For example, this is a very strong frost in Brazil, which affected enormously production, which went down from 28 million to only just 9 million bags. You can imagine what that does with the world market price. It's short. That year we got to 347 cents per pound. Yeah. Now, this has been going down a little bit in fluctuation, thanks to technology and thanks to the use of uh, irrigation. But here we see also the influence of, of uh, climate change. These are three, four years uh, on a row with a drought, for example. So we see that there are some changes. Now, if you compare that with uh, Vietnam, from nothing, they got to 30 million bags. Here we had some problems with droughts and, and, and floodings, etc. But they are more or less stable and the fluctu fluctuations are much less than in, in Brazil. And then we've got uh, Colombia. They had a dip because of uh, coffee leaf rust, but they're more or less stable around 14, 13, 14 million bags lately. And here we have uh, Indonesia. They also grew, but they are more or less stable between 10 and 11 million bags. Isn't that much uh, different? Much lower level of uh, of technology and of productivity, by the way, Indonesia. Now here you can compare the fluctuation between two crops in Brazil with the other main uh, producers and the rest of the world. And you can clearly see that it's Brazil that, that, that makes the big difference. And that's why Brazil is so important for, for pricing. Now, if you look at uh, the outlook for, for uh, this year, Brazil uh, this year ended up with a uh, total production of between 65 and uh, 70 million bags, almost 50 million bags of Arabica. Yeah. This is 10 million more than uh, the last season and 5 million more than two years ago when they had a, a record uh, harvest. So this is a record after a record after a record. Total exports were 44 and a half million bags, including 4 million bags of instant coffee against 40.7 million bags in 2019. That's almost 4 million bags extra. That notwithstanding the, the scarcity of containers due to the impact of COVID-19, I'll, I'll uh, come back to that later on. Yeah. The eyes are now on the 21-22 halves, and it's starting very soon. They start harvesting around April, May. And uh, the forecast is that the uh, Arabica production will uh, drop at least 30% due to drought in the main producing regions in, in between September and uh, November, where uh, flowering is taking place in uh, Brazil. This is linked to the La Nina phenomenon. Whilst the uh, robusta production is to increase more or less uh, by 2 million bags. And the overall uh, ever, average uh, forecast of of all the sources I've been looking at, uh, indicate that it's going to be below 54 million bags. So that's that's quite a lot of difference uh, with, with last season. Then we've got uh, domestic consumption, 22, 23 million bags. It's not going to increase uh, this year because of the, the, the closure of, of so many uh, coffee shops, restaurants, etc., due to the, the pandemic. Now, total demand of 40 to 45 million bags of exports, then 20, 23 million bags of consumption, that makes between 62 and 68 million bags against a supply of 54 million only. We have to add to that the carryover stocks, what's left from the previous season comes into the new season. This is going to increase from 1.85 million a year ago to uh, by the end of this season, which ends in June, probably will be a little bit more than 5 million bags, but it's less than demand. So the fact that there will be a, a, a deficit in, in Brazil, the main producer will increase uh, price. 
Vietnam, total uh, production of up to 30, 31 million bags. This year, it's going to go down to probably some 28 million bags, although there are some uh, who think that it will uh, go down even further, maybe to 25 million, that because of the lack of rains during the flowering period. The harvest uh, after the flowering was delayed because of hurricanes and uh, heavy rains at the end of uh, last year, plus there was the scarcity of containers. So they're quite behind uh, the normal volume that, that we do uh, in the first few months. They start in, in October, the, the harvest. Vietnam exported 26.4 million bags last uh, season, left a carryover of uh, four and a half million bags stock. And uh, export are expected to drop to uh, below 25 million bags this season. Export figures include 2.8 million bags of instant and roasted coffee. And the target in Vietnam is to increase this in the next coming years up to 25% uh, uh, of total exports. That will change the, the way the, the, the market behaves well, because uh, processed coffee like instant and roasted coffee is a completely different uh, weight in, in, into uh, world market prices than uh, green coffee. Then domestic consumption increased to 3.1 million bags and continues growing. Forecast for this uh, year is 3.25 million bags, which means that in the next few years, we can expect that uh, green bag uh, exports from Vietnam will drop probably below 20 million bags. And that, that's really going to change a lot that's happening in the world market because of this enormous increase from zero almost to 30 million bags do, during 20, 30 years. Uh, Vietnam has really uh, weighted heavily into to pricing. They are the cheap, more or less the cheapest coffee that's available in the market. Exports in Southeast Asia are affected by the lack of containers due to COVID-19 and the, the international trade flows have changed and there's a kind of accumulation of uh, containers in Europe and the scarcity in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, but also, for example, in uh, Brazil. So that's, that's really uh, changing uh, a lot uh, what's going on and the, the, the freight rates are, are increasing enormously. Output from Colombia has more or less uh, been more or less stable in the last few years at around uh, 14 million bags and exports, some 13 million. Uh, domestic consumption is rather low, 1.9 million bags. Over a million years per, uh, bags per year is imported from uh, countries like Brazil, uh, Honduras and Peru, both for domestic consumption and for the export of free, uh, freeze-dried coffee. Brazil uh, supplies a lot of cheap coffee and Colombia prefers put that into this uh, freeze-dried coffee instead of their top uh, quality West Arabicas. Indonesia is expected to produce 10 to 11 million bags, again, five years in a row already around that uh, volume. Exports are under pressure from the strong growth in the domestic consumption in Indonesia and have dropped from 10 to 7 million bags on average in the last five years. Domestic consumption in Indonesia rose uh, to 4.9 million bags last season, but this year it is expected to uh, drop below 4.5 million because of the pandemic, because of closing down so many uh, businesses, like in, in, in almost all the countries. Now, the production of other amounts in uh, Latin America, after the coffee leaf rust, we covered to 24, 25 million bags. Uh, but dropped two, three million bags last season. The reason for this is mainly uh, laying in Honduras, which almost tripled production to seven and a half million bags in the 2016-17 se season. They did that through uh, three seasons, but then they, they saw it fall back to 5.4 million in 2019-2020. And that's due to a combination of low prices high depths of, of producers, lack of inputs, lack of uh, hired uh, labor, problems that really affect the entire region. For 2021, there was a slight recovery uh, of production to 6.3 million bags uh, forecasted, but due to uh, two hurricanes which uh, hit Central America, Ita and Iota, uh, causing very uh, severe uh, damage to the infrastructure, this is affecting really transport from farm to mills. It also is affecting uh, a bit the, the 
production because of all kinds of diseases that uh, after uh, so many weeks of very uh, wet soils, high levels of uh, humidity in the soil. And also the, the containment measures uh, are hindering the movement of hired labor in, in, in the region. So probably production will be below 6 million bags this year. Not that high increase as they uh, originally expected. Then we've got last of all in Latin America is a main washed uh, Arabica production, uh, Peru. They've been producing about 4.4 million bags on average of its 1.5 million uh, is estimated to be organic certified. Peru is the number one supplier of fair trade organic uh, coffee in the world. But there are some serious issues uh, in the internal market causing very high local prices. There's a lot of competition. And a lot of the premiums of this, uh, this, this certified coffee are leaking away in, in, in this uh, fierce competition locally. Then Ethiopia forecast for 2021 is an output of 7.5 million bags, just like the previous season. And this is a million bags more than, than uh, the country used to produce up to five years ago. Domestic consumption dropped slightly to 3.40 million bags last season and is expected to increase to 3.4 million bags. This year, exports remain stable around 4.1 to 4.2 million bags, but there's a lot of uh, instability in the country, political and even armed conflicts, uh, a lot of uh, turmoil around the government and, and the industry is worried what, what impact this will have on the coffee business. Then, uh, according to uh, the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, production in Uganda was uh, 4.24 million bags last season and will increase to 4.8 million in 21-22. And exports will increase from 4 million to 4.5 million this season. These figures are quite different from what UCDA uh, reports. They talk about uh, 5.4 million bags export last season which is uh, 1.4 million bags more than uh, the US reports. And they forecast an increase of, uh, in production of 7% to 8 million bags this new season. I think this, this is a bit over optimistic, but I'll leave it to you to, to tell me what's the reality in uh, Uganda. In 2019-2020, uh, there was more or less a balance between supply and demand. For uh, 2021, we expect a surplus of between 7 and 10 million bags, depending a little bit on how uh, consumption will recover. But there is quite a surplus. Just that this has been uh, announced since more than a year ago. So that's why most of the last year we saw a very low price, because everybody was expecting already a top uh, production year this season. A recent inquiry among coffee traders and analysts by uh, Reuters showed that they expect on average an 8 million bag surplus in 2020-21 and an average deficit of 7.7, 7.8 million bags in 21-22 due particularly to the low output in Brazil but also to the recovery of uh, consumption growth in the second half of this year, what everybody's talking about. Very difficult to predict, but that's what they expect. For these same reasons, the Citigroup, one of the big uh, banks in, in, in this business, adjusted its uh, price forecast for Arabica from 121 to 129 on average in the second half of, of the year. Raul Bank manages a bandwidth of between 120, 110 sorry, and 130 cents per pound for Arabica, to be exceeded only until the end of the year. Now we see that we're already above that, but they predicted only just a month ago. But there we are. And uh, Robusta should be uh, over 1,450 metric tons by the end of the year. The same, we already see these kind of uh, price levels. This is the production the forecast of uh, uh, Rabobank. You can see where we were in the last few quarters and now what, how they expect prices to increase. And uh, this is on average, of course. And this is the price for uh, Robusta, which 
by uh, the end of the year should be at 1450 and then next year 1480, a level we are already looking uh, at. Just the question is if it can uh, maintain that uh, level. This is uh, according to, to what, what, what the supply and demand in the mainstream market is, uh, is expected to do. Now let's look at the differentiated coffee. We're talking here about certified coffee, verified coffees and uh, the high quality coffees. Now talking about certified coffees, Ut Certified and Rainforest Alliance announced a merger in 2017, which was completed uh, last year. Then they launched a new joint certification scheme, but sales are still reported separately until uh, last year. So we're looking now at the figures for 2019. Oots uh, sales uh, increased 14% to 9.8 million bags, which is 54% of all the, the coffee that is uh, certified with the Oots label. Uh, the average premium paid went down from 2.81 cents in 2018 to 2.13 cents in 2019. Rainforest Alliance uh, sales grew 20% in 2019 to 6.6 million bags. 56% of all the, the certified production is sold with the Rainforest Alliance label. Rainforest Alliance doesn't uh, publish uh, information on premiums, but usually they are higher uh, than for uh, Oud certified. The reason I will explain uh, that to you, it's, it's a different kind of coffee. 37% uh, of Oud certified coffee and 44% of Rainforest Alliance coffee is double certified, mainly between these two, but also there's some overlap with organic and uh, fair trade coffee. Then the new standards, they're talking about shared responsibility and the inclusive supply chain. The premium is now compulsory uh, and they're talking about long-term sustainability. There has been quite some discussion within uh, uh, Oots and the Rainforest uh, where to go together. Uh, there was even some discussion whether they should also introduce a minimum price. They decided not to do uh, that, but they now are talking about sustainability not as something that is happening now but something that you have to construct together between buyers and sellers uh, in in the future it, it's a process that will take uh, quite some time but you need to commit to that now this is the evolution of uh, the coffee sales uh, of goods the main uh, origins you see that by far the most important uh, origin is uh, Brazil, just like uh, in, in, in the mainstream markets. Then comes uh, Vietnam. Uh, Honduras is more important than Colombia. This is because it's cheaper coffee and uh, they grew so fast they have to look for a market there. Whilst uh, Colombia, low uh, premium, they're not so eager to, to sell this kind of uh, coffee. Then you've got Nicaragua, a small country, but quite some, uh, some, some volume uh, with oats. Then follow Peru, India, Guatemala, Uganda doesn't really appear among the main uh, suppliers here. Here we've got uh, Rainforest uh, Alliance coffee sales over the years. And here you can see that the, the, the origins are, are different. Brazil always in the lead, but the number two is uh, Colombia. It's not Vietnam. Why? Because there's much more preference among Rainforest Alliance buyers for Wash Arabica has better qualities. They're paying a slightly uh, higher price. These coffees, uh, anyway, have higher differentials. Yeah. And then uh, Guatemala, Honduras, also uh, Wash Arabica, good quality coffees. Costa Rica, Peru, Nicaragua, Mexico, El Salvador, all of them. And even Indonesia. This is partly uh, uh, Arabica from, from Sumatra, partly uh, Robusta. But the, the main uh, supplier of Robusta in this is uh, Vietnam. So you can also see that even uh, in, in these uh, main certifications, there is a, a trend more towards the, the better qualities than the, the mainstream market. Organic coffee sales grew from 2.7 million bags in 2017 to 4.2 million bags in 2019. 61% of uh, what is uh, certified as organic is sold as such. This was, for me, a, a surprise. This is, uh, comes from, from the Coffee Barometer, which was published last year, at the end of uh, the year, uh, because during quite some time, uh, the volume of uh, organic coffee sales uh, stagnated. 
but now it, it, it looks like it's uh, growing in again, but it's the only source I've uh, seen so far. 54% uh, of the organic sales is double certified organic and fair trade. Fair trade coffee sales uh, grew 6% in 2019 to 3.7 million. Uh, only 34% of what is certified as fair, uh, fair trade is sold as uh, such. Now, the double certified fair trade and organic share increased from 55% of total in 2018 to 61% in 2019. So there's a huge uh, overlap between organic and fair trade. You need to understand that the, the, the supply and demand balance in, in certified coffees is completely different from what is happening in the mainstream market. In the mainstream market, there is a surplus or a deficit of up to normally only 6% of total. Whereas in, in certified coffees, there's a difference between supply and demand of one to two or one to three. There's two or three times more production than there is a demand. This puts a strong pressure on uh, on these markets and on the pricing in these markets. And that in particular is the case with fair trade because of the fixed high premiums, 20 cents for fair trade, another 30 cents if it's also organic, and a high minimum price, 190 for certified organic, uh, washed Arabica, 160 for uh, so for a non-organic and also on, on, on uh, Robusta, there's a good premium and, and actually it's, it's, it's a higher premium even because of the rather, uh, rather, uh, rather high minimum price for Robusta. Then producer organizations in fair trade are regaining some control over the exports. They were giving way to private exporters, but by uh, 2019 they recovered a control over 57% of all exports of fair trade from origin. Here is uh, the grow growth uh, curve for organic. It stagnated during uh, quite a few years and now it's, it's apparently it's growing again. These are the fair trade sales over the years. And the main origins of fair trade here you can see uh, Peru is the number one. Colombia just overtook uh, in 2019. Honduras is the second most important uh, supplier. Then we've got Mexico, where it all started a long time ago. Brazil lost market share because one uh, or two of the main buyers uh, switched from organic naturals to uh, from non organic naturals to uh, organic certified. Washed Arabicas coffee that Brazil doesn't have, so it lost quite a lot of volume to these other countries. Then Indonesia, Guatemala, Nicaragua went down because of the, the internal uh, problems they had in 2018, which uh, made uh, a lot of buyers scare away in the, the next season. Then you've got Ethiopia as the main uh, supplier in uh, in Africa. Uh, India is now the main supplier in uh, in Asia after Indonesia. And we've uh, got Uganda as the number two in, in, in Africa. Where are these uh, sales going? Main market uh, still is uh, the USA in fair trade. The number two is uh, Germany, then the United Kingdom, Canada, France, Sweden, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and all the other countries. Yeah. And these are not that much, but they are still uh, growing these markets, particularly the, 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 the largest ones, Germany and the USA. And we are a bit uh, fearful about what's happening this year. I'll talk about that uh, when we touch upon the impact of COVID-19. Here we can see how uh, producer organizations were giving way in exports to private exporters. From 62% they had to, uh, in 2013, they went down to 49%, but in 2019 they, they recovered part of the control over the, the exports again. Then we've got the verified coffee. For C, verified coffee sales volume went slightly down from 10 million bags in 2017 to 9.9 .9 million in 2019. The verified volume dropped dramatically from 39.4 to 26.8 million bags. Apparently, a lot of producers of this coffee aren't that really uh, interested uh, anymore. One of the reasons is that 
the demands uh, regarding sustainability are very weak and the premium is zero. There's no price incentive to, uh, to join this uh, for C scheme. Nestle is the main buyer of 4C, pumping up its sustainability targets. Doesn't cost them uh, much or anything, and they can show that they, they do a lot. Nestle is uh, Nespresso. It's a separate brand within the company. It manages its own uh, AAA sustainability quality program, but in close coordination with Rainfloor, uh, Rainforest Alliance. It grew from 1.28 million bags in 2017 to 1.40 million bags in 2019, almost meeting the target they had put themselves a couple of years ago of 1.5 million bags. A total of 1.9 million bags are verified under this uh, AAA program in uh, 2019. Then we've got Starbucks. Uh, they did 5.1 million bags in 2019, which is 99% of all the purchases under cafe practices against 4.75 million in 2017. The total volume of, of this verification uh, under fact, uh, sorry, under cafe pr uh, practices is seven and a half million bags. Total volume of verified coffee, if you put together all these main uh, initiatives, is 16 and a half million bags in 2019. And total volume of certified coffee is about 19.5 million bags, eliminating double and, and triple certifications. So the total of what we could call uh, sustainable coffees uh, is 36 million bags now. Volume growth has been strong, but to what extent this really contributes to sustainability and to the improvement of farmers' income is, is questionable. If you look at those very low uh, premiums that are being paid and where the world market is uh, with, with pricing, it's, it's very difficult to talk about sustainability here. The 10 largest roasters represent a volume of uh, 60 million bags, which is 35, 36% of world consumption. Of this total volume they, that they, uh, they roast, 21 million bags or 35% of total is certified or verified coffee. The level of commitment to sustainability varies very much from one roaster to another, both in volume, some have a very high volume, others hardly any, and it also varies whether they go for an extra light version like, for example, uh, 4C or a more serious long-term commitment to the producer. Large traders such as Dreyfus, Econ, Neumann, Orlam and Volcafé, eating and have Volcafé, all have their own sustainability uh, programs as well. Apart from uh, working with the existing uh, schemes, they also have their own uh, programs. Now, here, if you put together all these certification and, and verifications, I leave out, out all the smaller uh, initiatives. There are uh, an awful lot more, like kosher and bird friendly, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the, taking the main uh, certification and verifications, we're now talking about 36 million bags. So it is really growing a lot question is to what extent really works it works for for producers sorry that was too fast here here you can see uh, the main roasters in the world uh, Nestle they do a total of 907,000 tons out of this, 606,000 are verified or certified. And this is mainly 4C. They're the main users of uh, 4C. Then we've got uh, Jacobs Dalweg with Pete's. They do a total of 730,000 uh, tons. Out of this, 153 are verified or certified. They mainly work with Oots. And then we've got uh, JM Smoker, 36,000. Starbucks, almost all their uh, volume, but it's their own cafe practices with some certification to do a little bit of uh, fair trade, etc. Although compared to, to others, it, in volume it's quite quite a lot. Strauss, hardly any commitment to uh, anything like this. Lawats are very limited. Kraft Heinz, since they uh, split up, it's not really clear what they're doing. Melitta, it's a rather large uh, uh, roaster from Germany, 36 out of 195,000. UCC, a uh, Japanese uh, roaster, who took over some business in Europe as well. 
45 out of 190,000. Then we've got uh, Chibo, similar, eight, uh, 38 out of 180. And then we've got, uh, it's Italian, I can't read it right now, but it's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with it. Okay. And then looking at the higher quality coffee, there is a specialty coffee transaction guide being published the last couple of years. And this is one of the most interesting uh, sheets where they compare the prices according to the cup profile. It goes from 80 to 82, then 82, 84, etc., all the way up to uh, 88 or better. Now, this is quite a lot of information, not easy to interpret. So I made a summary of it, which is this. Yeah. Now, here we see the four-year average. The lower end, which is 25th uh, percentile, which means that we take out the 25 uh, lowest uh, uh, to, to have a more uh, credible uh, range, we take out the 25 highest, and then we look at the lower end, the upper end, and the median. Yes. Now we can see that for uh, cup profiles from 80 to 82, it goes from 130 to 184 dollars per pound, yeah. which in terms of, of a differential, if you compare that with the, the average New York price in all these years, uh, was between 0.13 cents, which is almost nothing, to 0.4 in the maximum 0.44. So you can get closer uh, to, to, uh, to, to where you want as a target, which is uh, two cents uh, per pound, sorry, $2 per pound. If you do a lot, not just look at quality, but also work on marketing, on relationship with your buyers, etc. Yeah. First of all, it's, it's quality. You can clearly see that if you go up with your quality, your price get a lot better, sorry, a lot better. Yeah. But also, if you invest in, in marketing and in, uh, in, 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 in relationship with your buyers, you can substantially increase the value of your coffee, the price of your coffee. And that's, I think, it's an important message. It's working on quality. And I'm absolutely uh, convinced that everybody can improve the quality of the cup. Uh, of the coffee that uh, the, the producers uh, produce and how you process it afterwards. But it's also about investing in relationships and investing in promoting your product to uh, get a better price. So that's a kind of alternative route to certification. Fair trade or rainforest or whatever certification. You can also do a lot when you, uh, and even more, if you work on, on uh, quality and on relationships and on promotion of your coffee. Now, that also goes for the, the size of, of, of the, the, the lots that you uh, ship. Okay. The smaller the size of, of the lot of coffee that you uh, sell, the higher the price. We are talking here really about micro lots. Then you get a much higher price. Okay. Then if you send a container load or more uh, to your buyers, so, so that's also an element. Where are you positioned as, a, as an organization? Do you have very small volumes? Maybe it would be most interesting to work on this. But if you have larger volumes and you want to sell all the coffee of your members at, at a reasonable price, then you need to be a bit more realistic and, and don't expect these kind of super prices. Yeah. So... Like I said, the, the starting point is that all coffees can increase in cup quality. My target for a uh, sustainable price, a sustainable production of coffee would be, in the case of Arabica, $2 per pound or an attractive competitive differential of 50 cents or 60, 70 cents on top of the world market price. Then you get to a similar price. Then the better the cup profile, the better the price. We saw that. But also marketing and relationship with the buyers, the traceability, etc., are very important to get a, a, a decent price and get closer to, to sustainability for your farmers. The smaller the lot size, the higher the price, but producing and selling micro lots is expensive. And if you try it, you will find out soon that a lot of uh, micro lots are being rejected because these buyers are really demanding and they may change their uh, 
opinion from one season to another. And there you are with a lot of uh, effort invested in improving the best quality. And you, you yourself and your members frustrated because they didn't accept the coffee. Fair trade organic suits more for cup profiles below 84, between 80 and 84, and lots of uh, 40,000 or more uh, bags. Yeah. 84 or better cups and smaller lot sizes of uh, uncertified coffee fetch better prices because it's a completely different focus. So it really depends upon where you are, what will be the right balance between certifications, your cup profile, your lot size, your cost, your consistency of the cup of full container lot and the price you want to differentiate, uh, differentiate between your members up to what extent is that accepted by the membership. Now the incidence of fair trade certification on different market segments. Like I said, uh, above 84, it's more the quality than the certification. So fair trade organic only is 11.4% of all the coffees of uh, a cup profile above 84. But between 80 and 84, it's 26.4%. So to a very large extent, fair trade organic and uh, these coffees overlap. Fair trade organic is really a, a, an important part of that. Now, above, uh, uh, below uh, 40,000 pounds, below a container load, fair trade organic only represents 10.7%. But above 40,000 bags, it represents almost 30%. So it's really more geared fair trade organic towards uh, uh, cup profiles 8084 and a full container load or more. Whilst the non certified coffees, do much better in, in, in higher uh, cup profiles in small, smaller lot sizes. Now, if we uh, look at uh, the cup profile and the price for the different uh, types of coffee, you can see that cup profiles 81, 82, even uh, 82 and a half, there you can see that uh, fair trade organic with smaller sizes. They do, they do have some, some importance here, but below the, uh, going higher up in your cup profile, it's more the non-certified small uh, lot coffees that fetch a much higher, higher price. And the larger volumes of fair trade uh, organic, they do go up also, but to a less extent in price according to the cup profile. So it's, here it's really quality, here it's a combination of cup profile quality and your fair trade organic certification. Now the impact of COVID-19. When the pandemic uh, emerged, consumers panicked and started hoarding products of basic necessities, which included coffee. So there was a tremendous increase in the amount of uh, coffee. Uh, the funds, the speculators sent this and uh, the futures price uh, in New York went up because they were betting on a price increase. At the same time, the quality differentials for the better qualities coffee spiked, which is rather uh, exceptional because normally if New York goes up, your differentials go down in the other way around because it's a way of compensating. It's, New York is very much speculation and you're uh, differentials are really more on the physical coffee, the quality, the consistency, etc. But this uh, expressed this, this double increase in both your base price in New York and your uh, quality differentials. The worry that uh, the, the, the buyers had regarding the supply of these coffees. They were really worried and the differentials remained high throughout uh, the whole of 2020. Standard grades freely available from stocks in, uh, in, in, in consumer countries, they didn't uh, react to this. The differentials remained rather stable and, and even went down when the, 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 the harvest in, in the bumper crop in, uh, in Brazil started. Robusta price in London also wasn't touched by this, continued falling uh, until July. But by May, the initial worries about supply faded out and were substituted by worries regarding demand. And buyers, instead of buying more and more coffee, switched to spot uh, purchases and really what we call hand-to-mouth uh, purchases. Only what they needed at that moment was bought because they were 
worried about how much uh, consumption would be affected by this uh, pandemic. The bumper crop from Brazil started flowing by that time as well, and the New York price dropped to below 100 cents again. From 130 that went up, it went down to less than uh, 100. Now, what more impact do we see? Restaurants, cafes, offices, schools, etc. they closed during months, and many of these, uh, these places are still uh, closed. Out of home consumption, we, we, we uh, write it out as OOH, uh, fell dramatically. The branded coffee shop chains in the UK, like Costa Coffee and Starbucks, sorry, have lost 40% of their total sales in 2020. And they estimate that it will take at least uh, four years to recover from this. Small specialty roasters and specialty uh, cafes lost their market to a large extent. And many uh, independent businesses, which are now being supported by programs, uh, support programs by uh, of the government, they will go uh, bankrupt when these programs end. Yeah. Certificate coffee sales will also be affected, where these depend to a high degree upon out of home consumption, like fair trade in the UK, in France, and in Holland. So we are really worried. The, about what total uh, fair trade sales will be 2020 and uh, 2021, because this still goes on. Large roasters and supermarkets with their own brands saw turnover grow thanks to the increase of coffee consumption at home, but this doesn't compensate the loss of the out of home consumption. And consumption of expensive coffees, like for example, whole beans also grew. Consumers who uh, no longer could visit their cafes, could go to a concert, go on holiday, they started creating their own experience of a kind of uh, luxury uh, cafe at home with uh, some special machines, uh, as long as you've got the money at least for it, all kinds of luxuries that they uh, now have at home, because they don't, can't go anywhere, and they've got the money for it. Poor people, of course, can't afford that. The ICO estimates that coffee consumption dropped 4 million bags from 164.5 in 2019-2020 to, uh, sorry, to 164.5. Before that, it was above 168 million bags. This due to the pandemic. But they expect uh, consumption to recover in 2020-21, this season, to 166.6 million bags. Still 2 million below where it was uh, two years ago. USDA uh, estimates that consumption dropped by 2.1 million bags to 160.8 million in 2020. And this is to grow to 2.6 million, uh, by 2.6 million bags to 165.4 million this year. This means that if we have an average annual growth of uh, 2% uh, previous to 2020, instead of continue growing, we lost coffee and it's a total of six to eight million bags that will uh, be consumed less in these two years. This adds to the surplus that was already there. So this additional uh, surplus was already discounted into the coffee price since last year. Everybody was looking at it, like I said before, and the eyes are now all on the lower crop in Brazil. The global deficit also and the expected recovery of uh, consumption growth in the second half of this year. But it all depends on what will happen with the pandemic, if they are able to control the third wave. Also, there uh, was a lot of impact on the coffee trade. Uh, Coex, big trader, closed its doors after 40 years. ED and F man Vol Cafe uh, got already were in trouble, got worse with the pandemic. Uh, Amajaro already had problems before that. He also closed uh, part of their business. And several large commodity traders in, in Asia, particularly in, in oil, uh, were accused of fraud. After the, the oil prices dropped dramatically uh, in March, April last year, it came out that they, they, they had been cheating uh, the system. And this caused a lot of problems, not only to themselves, but also to the financial sector. And we see that ABN AMRO, Credit Agricole, BNP Paribas, ING, Rabobank, Societe Generale, to mention the main uh, large banks involved in commodity finance, you're all 
pulling out uh, of, of, of uh, commodities partly or entirely. Okay. That will uh, squeeze the liquidity of uh, commodity, tra commodity trade. That includes coffee. We already see a lot of questioning of uh, coffee trade uh, in, in the link with money laundering practices, with drug, uh, drug trafficking, etc. Um, this is uh, often by the, the trade pushed back to the last one and the weakest uh, link in the supply chain, which is the producer. We see that, that producer organizations sometimes have to wait for months to get paid because of the lack of liquidity of the traders. Nobody knows what the new normal will be. People will continue drinking coffee and return to the coffee shops when they open up again. We sent that before, but there are some changes there to stay. For example, people will continue to work more from home. This will reduce coffee consumption at work. Online sales boosted, and this will also continue. So the way coffee is being in other products is being distributed is changing. Many processes, like for example in logistics, are being digitalized. And many events and encounters will be online in the future. So the, the, the new normal will be different from the old normal. This poses a threat if you don't adapt, but it also can be an opportunity if you do adapt. It's really up to you to what extent you're able to, to uh, to, to, to adapt to these processes. For example, digitalizing your processes. The impact of COVID-19 on producer countries has been immense. Uh, some countries really suffered. Brazil, you probably read it, enormous amount of people got uh, infected and died. Uh, although in relative terms, Peru was much harder hit than uh, Brazil. But on production and on the supply chain of coffee, the, the problems are rather limited and, and Things like, for example, uh, problems with, with, with hired labor, transporting uh, works for the harvest, but which were a real problem in the beginning uh, of, of, of last year, they got sorted gradually. So we don't expect that it will really affect in the end. The disruption of trade flows, I mentioned it before, has created a large excess of containers in regions like Europe and a big scarcity in countries like Brazil and Vietnam. But it caused delays. It didn't really uh, affect the overall volume. It's just being shipped one or two months later, but it does get there. And since there's enough uh, stocks of these coffees in the consumer countries, it doesn't really affect the business. Freight rates have been under pressure due to trade conflicts, etc., between the uh, US and China. So there was much less demand and there was an oversupply uh, of, 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 of containers but now that these disruptions uh, cause scarcity in certain regions, the shipping companies took advantage and they continue doing that. For example, the rates from Vietnam to uh, Europe were at $1,500, $1,500 per container. They now jumped to $7,000 US dollar per container in January. That's enormous uh, increase. And I even read about a small uh, nut producer who had to pay, pay $28,000 to get his uh, products uh, shipped. Yeah. This is my presentation for today. If there are any questions before uh, going into the exercises for, uh, for this week, please. If you have any comment, any question, just unmute your uh, microphone and, and start talking. Just thanks for that presentation. Uh, there were some hands that were raised. Okay. First, let's have a uh, A comment from Masereka Alfred, raise the hand, and Mohindo Samuel with Lawrence Masagas. Uh, let's begin with uh, Masereka Alfred. Yes, please.
Yes, Alfred. Okay, if Alfred is uh, still busy, let's have Samuel Mohindo. Yes, Samuel Mohindo. Okay, let's get a, a question from Alice. Thank you so much, Yours. This is mm -hmm. my second training this year. Um, my question is, how are we going to upscale our businesses this year, given the downturn we experienced in 2019, last year actually? Are there any measures you can share with us? What it means for you? Well, first of all, uh, the reduction in, in consumption is limited. So, and, and it is uh, expected to recover this year. So that the impact is, is rather limited. I don't think it will really affect you. Um, I don't think it will uh, affect price because uh, supply is also much more limited. And you also need to understand, even though now they're having a big surplus, but the market is always looking forward. What is happening now with supply and demand is what we saw in the price last year. The price this year will depend on what will happen with supply and demand next year. And since the, 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 the production in uh, Brazil is going down, and it is expected that uh, consumption growth will uh, start recovering uh, this year, you can expect the price to go up. And you already see it now. You can already see that, for example, in New York, the price went up 120 to 140 in just uh, a couple of weeks. That's a reaction of the market to what may happen in the future. One of the reasons behind it is the drought in Brazil and that uh, is affecting uh, not only the next crop, but they're even talking about uh, that, that the crop in two years' time in Brazil will be affected. You know that the people who are agronomists or, or, or farmers know that coffee really is a two-year cycle. So if the, the plant as such is being damaged, the capacity to produce in two years' time will also uh, be affected. So we can expect more scarcity and it, it will give a better price. But then it depends on what market you are selling to. If you sell to the fair trade market and you sell to uh, buyers who depend to a large extent upon the sales to those countries where there's a high out-of-home consumption, then you can expect some problems there. Because that is probably going down because of the lockdown measures in many countries that are still in place. And you can see that. There are some countries like the UK, Holland, uh, France, where 60, 70% of the fair trade sales is out of home consumption. And that will go down. It will be compensated to a certain extent by at home consumption. People increase consumption of coffee because they now work from home. Uh, or they, they, they study uh, from home because the schools are closed as well. But it's not to the same extent. You don't drink the same uh, volume of coffee if you're just sitting uh, at home. If you meet people and, and you chat and you talk and etc., consumption is stimulated. Yeah. So that will really uh, change. Now, and it also depends on how you engage with your uh, market. If you're buying and selling locally, it will not really affect you. But if you export for your own account, it will change. 
but it is also an opportunity. First of all, you need to adapt. So you will have to invest as well in technology, in, in, in going more digital with your processes, but it also gives you the opportunity, for example, to try to link more into uh, the relationships. If before the relationship with a, cons uh, with a, a supermarket was mainly between the, the roaster and the supermarket and between a trader and the, the roaster was mainly between them, now they do a lot online. So that gives you the opportunity. If you go online, you've got a good story there to tell. You are uh, on, on Twitter or on Instagram or whatever every day. You can get your message across, can influence it. And that's useful for, for a buyer because it helps them to tell a story and try to convince people to, to have that experience and to enjoy the, the not just... The, the, the nice coffee from, from Uganda, for example, but also see what are people behind it, what kind of environment they're, they're, they're working, these beautiful sceneries of the mountains where you produce your coffee, etc. So that's an opportunity as well, but you need to invest in it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jos, for that. Let's have a... a, a, a um, Lisa John Wagawa, you raise your hand. Mr. John Wagawa from SCPCU. John. Yes, John. Um, Mr. Maserica, if your your hand is still up, I think you're back. You have a question. Okay, let's have uh, Mr. Masagazi. Mr. Masagazi, raise your comment. Or your question, please. I've got a question here uh, from Lawrence. What is uh, behind the current rally in the futures prices? Behind that is what I already tried to explain, the worry what will happen in the future. There is talk about uh, a serious impact in, 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 uh, in Brazil. There are some people who have been circling around there. One is Judy Gaines, a rather famous. We had a lot of videos. We were talking about a dropping in production of Arabica of almost 50%. And that makes the market nervous. But it also has to do with what is happening in the commodity markets as a whole. Uh, all the commodities are increasing in value, almost all, not just coffee. And that is a kind of general trend where then uh, large investors who, who speculate a lot say, okay, I'm going to change my portfolio folio, and I invest more in commodities. One of the reasons why they invest in commodities is commodity is a real thing. Coffee is something you can put your hand on. Whereas a lot of the investments that they've been making is in indexes and stuff like that. And they are not doing that well. Behind that is also the worry what will happen to the world economy. Uh, they talk ab uh, about uh, inflation that it will uh, increase again. But we hardly had any inflation in many countries for years because of all these measures and pumping uh, money into the, the economy. It's all changing now. So there's a kind of reshuffling uh, going on within the, the financial markets. I see here that participants are not able to unmute themselves. Wilbur, can you do something about that? Yes, our IT personnel can is looking at, but he's saying that they can unmute. That functionality is okay. Well, maybe we can don't know how to do it. <laughs> I need the volume. William, I need the volume.
Yes, Mr. Masereka, unmute. And then uh, you give us your question. Got here Alfred uh, Mubangisi. I'm unable to unmute. I think uh, yes, there, I have a problem. there is that new comment from Hello. Alfred. Yes. Hello? Hello? I think he has Hello. a problem with his device. Hello? Maybe before that, let's have Hello? Mr. John Wagaba say something. I've John, I've been able to get an unmuted. Uh, you unmuted now, John. <laughs> yeah, just thanks a lot for the presentation. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, and the, somehow I missed some because my internet was on and off. I hope you resend us this presentation of course. so that we can read slowly you a bit faster than some of us. It is giving us vital information. But secondly, um, I want to ask you, uh, on the fair trade market, it looks to be dwindling, especially the fair trade market for 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 Robusta, especially for fair trade only. We can hardly get a contract for fair trade only. So I would wish you to comment on that. Then sadly, uh, this is not directed on what you have been taking us through, but uh, it's about hedging. Yes. I, I was trying to hedge some coffee because somebody has given me a contract for October. And yes. the last year, I lost some money because I didn't protect myself. There is a time when the market went down. By the time I, it was fixing mass, the price was low. So now someone who wanted to help me said, if the price goes beyond what I have paid, that the difference is his. Is that true? I thought the difference would also be mine, even like when the price goes down. Those mm -hmm. are the two uh, few areas I need your guidance and response. Thanks a lot. Okay, John. Uh, as to uh, hedging, I think we'd better co communicate directly because it's a rather technical issue and I would need some information about your business, which I can understand is, is confidential, uh, to, to, to try to, to give you some advice. But in general, uh, hedging can be very useful, but it, it's, it's for only for those organizations who have some experience with it and, and some resources. And it can be very useful uh, in, 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 in both ways. It can help you to protect against price increase. It also can help you to, to protect uh, against price drops. So you, taking advantage of this uh, price increase now, you can put a kind of floor price for your members in case the, 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 the price goes down again. That, that in general. What was your other question, John? The first one? Uh, the other one was on the fair trade market. Yes. Uh, for Busta, is hardly there. If you want to sell fair trade only, there are no buyers. So we are stuck with the coffee. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I try to explain in general, uh, buyers are now buying spot because they don't know what will happen. So they're not that much interested in, in future uh, purchases, which means that you probably will have to wait with your coffee until they come by. We saw that in, in, in other countries as well. At the beginning, people couldn't sell it. And at the end, the buyers couldn't get a coffee because there was no coffee anymore. Of course, they had already sold it. So that's a bit of a playing a game. And it is also for the traders, it's a bit difficult because they depend on uh, what, what the roasters do. And the roasters, to a certain extent, depend on what, what will happen with, with the, the supermarkets. And since it's changing, it's moving from out of home to at home consumption, there's also some, some differences which is rather difficult to, to forecast what will happen. So there, there's an uncertainty that, that really exists in, in the market. Now, like I said, I'm convinced that it will go down in certain countries because of the large share of uh, out of home uh, consumption in, in some countries is 60 70 percent that will be affected no doubt to what extent we'll see but it will be affected i heard one example in holland it was down six percent that's not dramatic either but it, it does reduce uh, the demand so i think you need to be a little bit more patient maybe but you also need to look at the type of buyers that you've got. 
Where do they uh, sell most of their coffees? What countries and what segment of the market? What kind of roasters, where are they involved? To pick out those who, who do uh, rather well. Of course, I heard a few uh, roasters in, 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 in some countries who say, well, we have an excellent business also in fair trade this year. So you need to look at that. Investigate a little bit more who's doing well and, 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 and try to, to sell more in, in, in those uh, segments, in those countries. I don't know whether that helps. Yeah, thanks a lot, Josh. It helps. Yes. Yeah. Okay. More questions? system Yes. 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 We are saying is unable to unmute, and he has a problem with his device. Alfred, are you fine now? Yes, I'm fine. Okay, please present the. Hello? Yes, Alfred. Yes, dear. Hello? Hello? Yes? Yes, Alfred. Yes, uh, my question was, hello? 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 Alfred, speak, we are listening to you. Okay. Uh, I first uh, appreciate the present of today. And uh, what I wanted to know is, uh, based on what has has taught us, I wanted to know how can we monitor the results of the uh, pertaining business, particularly coffee, uh, as, we are, as, we are, as we are trying to target the, the international markets. How can we monitor the results that from a white away from the time of production up to the time of marketing the product? Thank you. The national market. Yes. What exactly uh, are you asking? I, I don't capture it. It's difficult I'm, to I'm asking that how can we monitor the results, especially in the areas of marketing, in areas of production, as we are going to target the national markets? Mm. Hello? Yes. <laughs> Alfred, I'm also not picking your question. My question is, repeat again. Uh, as we are trading in the coffee value chain, how can we monitor the results of coffee, especially if you want to look for different market of takers, different buyers, how can we monitor that this type of buyer is needs this kind of volume? Okay, yes. Yeah. 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 When type of coffee, find the type of coffee. Have you picked that question? Yes, yes. Um, Depends on, on how your relationship is with your buyer. If you are just buying and selling locally, simple, I got my coffee, I go there, this is the price they offer, and that's it. There's not much to improve there. But if you establish, even if you're only selling locally, a relationship with the buyer, where you try to understand where the buyer is selling, you need to engage with him, yeah? Yes. Try to find out what kind of bias he's got, what kind of coffee they're looking for, then you can improve. For example, uh, I work with a uh, producer organization in, in, in Colombia. They only do local sales, they don't export, but they've, they've got a very sophisticated quality control system. And they've got all kinds of certification schemes and all kinds of, uh, of uh, cup profiles, not only the pointing, but also the, 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 the qualities of it. They've got a, 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 a matrix with about 20, 30 prices, different prices. 
Yeah? And that's how they collect the coffee from the farmers as well. So what they do is they filter out all these coffees according to certification and the cup profile, a bit like you saw in the specialty coffee guide. That's what, what they do. And they get a much better price because they sell it separately, not as a bulk. Now that depends on the kind of coffee that you have. Yeah. If you are working uh, mainly with natural uh, robustas, it's not that easy. But if you work with washed arabicas, it's easier to do that. But also in robusta, you can differentiate your quality. That's the first thing that you need to do. Separate the different qualities. Because that enables your buyer, local buyer, to look for different markets with a premium abroad. You need to differentiate the, 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 the type of coffee that you, you uh, sell. If it's bulk, same quality as everyone else, you won't be able to influence very much. Now, if you do that, then you can also start working on the relationship. Okay, we're now here. What more can we do? Would you like to expand in this coffee or that coffee? Then you're looking much more in, in, into the future. What will we do over the next couple of years? It, it's about building relationship and it's about knowing your market, what is going on beyond the, the direct buyer that you've got. What, where is he selling? What is he? Oh, thank you. Yep. And it's about consistency. You need to be delivering all the time in a very reliable way the same kind of uh, quality that you have been offering all the time. And I even know some, uh, some organizations who adapt the coffee, the way they process it, to specific requirements of buyers. For example, now I want uh, coffee fermented without uh, oxygen. Or I want 36 uh, hours of fermentation. Because it gives a different flavor to the coffee. But that's already a lot more sophisticated, but they do it. Yeah. Thank you, Yotz, for that. Thank you. We have the last question from Henry Wanichan. Please raise your question. Yes, Henry. Yes, Henry. We are listening. You can unmute. Can you get me? Hello. Huh? Yes, Henry. Uh, can you get me? Yes, we are hearing, please. Oh, okay, great. I'm saying um, I want to commend Joe for highlighting that uh, uh, we should really focus uh, on quality quality improvement because uh, I, can, I can confess for the last uh, two years it has been so hard selling certified coffee and especially fair trade. Uh, the market, as John has put it, is really dwindling, not, not only for Robusta, but really uh, fair trade market. Though we see it increasing in, uh, in the statistics, but uh, it's really been hard. And I think what you have said that um, we need to concentrate on improving our quality and uh, we reach the extent where we, we sell a specialty, we sell above 83. I think that's, that's maybe the right way. And also selling in, in, in small lots. You know, most of us organization concentrate on uh, uh, a, a container lot or at least a box. Or so. so so it is, it's also hard. It's hard when markets are down. My question would be like uh, the situations where um, the, the local price, I mean, the, the international price, the, the New York is getting down for Arabica. But again, you find uh, the local market is going up. And if, in, if you have a contract, a futures contract uh, really becomes hard. How do you handle a situation like that? And yet you know that if you buy at a higher price, you're really getting into a tricky situation where you might end up making a loss if you don't break even. Thank you. Yes. 
Um, well, that, that's a tricky thing uh, all the time. Uh, if you sell uh, at an outright price, it, it's always a problem if you do that forward. You can only do it uh, spot, but then you need to have the coffee at the same time. So it's, it's really a struggle. I, I understand that perfectly. Yeah. What you uh, need to work out is a, a strategy with all those elements. Uh, probably you're not used to, to, to uh, work with options because that's one, one way of doing it. Uh, but maybe you can explore with your bias the use of options and start learning how to use them. Yeah. But be careful. It, it, it requires uh, knowledge and it requires resources and it can affect uh, your position even more. Only when you've got a margin for that you can, can afford it. But there are also other ways of trying to, to, uh, to, to manage your uh, risk. One way of doing it is trying to reduce as much as possible the time between buying and selling. Now, and I don't know what markets you are in and what your financial situation is. One way of, of, of reducing the risk also is try to rotate as fast as possible. Because that means that you're constantly looking at new prices, new prices. Or maybe... I don't know. Do you export, or do you sell uh, full container loads to an exporter? No, we do export. You do export. Okay. That's now, right. one way of, of managing that, because in the exports, selling at a, at a fixed price forward, that, that's that's quite a risk. Because there's some two three months between when you buy and when you sell uh, sometimes. Uh, but one thing of, of of one way of doing that is combining local sales with exports. Because locally, you can rotate much faster. For yes. example, with some uh, organizations, they get finance for a couple of containers, let's say. They won't use all that money from the start for, for, for all, buying all this coffee. It takes a, a couple of weeks or a couple of months to put together all, all, all uh, that coffee that you're going to export. What you can do, meanwhile is use that money in the local market, buying and selling, buying and se selling on a weekly basis, for example. So during the week, you're constantly looking at purchase and sales price with just a few days difference. That somehow closes the gap between uh, your, your exports, purchases and sales, if you see what I mean. And rotation it always helps. It also helps to create, even if it's a small margin, will add a little bit of a margin to uh, to your to your business, which makes your, your position a little bit stronger. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Does it help you? Yeah, it does so much. Okay, good. Thank you. Anybody with another, the last question? Before we proceed. Okay, let's all unmute our mics, our mics, and we proceed with us. Yes, let's proceed to the next step, yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Now, this is uh, the New York price for uh, Arabica. And here we see the price for uh, Robusta. My questions to evaluate the harvest and start planning the new one. If you analyze the information on the market trends and looking at the price movement and 
New York and London exchanges in the last few weeks. What do you expect the Arabica or Robusta price to go in uh, in, in, in 2021? And <coughs> where do you think this will end this year? How will it evolve? Because that's important for your strategy, your harvest plan. Yeah. The second question. What is your main market and how relevant is what happens in the New York and London terminal markets for you? Because this is different. If you've got a lot of volume, you sell against those futures markets, of course you need to work with that. And there you do things like, like John mentioned, hedge your positions, etc. But if you may, are mainly into fair trade uh, sales, is it really that relevant? Or when is it relevant? Depends also where the market is. Right. Or if you were only selling locally, is it really that important to understand what New York and, and London are doing? Does it help you to understand what, what the market is doing? That, that's the question. Now, if you compare the price scenario for this year, where you think the market will uh, go, with that of last year, what does it mean for you in terms of the volume? If the price actually goes up like it does at the moment, does it affect your volume? Does it affect your profit or your loss uh, position, your need for finance, the finance, and does it impact on the risk that you're having for that? And are you prepared for uh, what to do or what do you miss to be uh, prepared? And if you've got something concrete, maybe we can help you. We can offer you some. Now, We've been talking about COVID-19, but do you, for your organization, see that as a threat or as an opportunity? Why? Why is it a threat or why it is an opportunity? Yeah. And the last question, which is really more about this kind of, of, of uh, workshops and webinars, does okay. the part of, uh, analysis help you in your planning and decision? How does it help? You're absolutely allowed to say no if you think, well, nice to do it, but it doesn't really help me. Just let us know because it's important for us as well. You're doing an effort, you're making an effort. ADC also wants to continue doing uh, this, but we need to know up to what extent what we try to do is really achieving the objective. So please let us know what you think of it. And the idea is that you uh, go through these uh, questions and answer them uh, to uh, ADC. And now we'll be looking at it by the end of the week. I think it's Thursday that you are uh, requested uh, as a deadline to uh, send in your answers. And I'll be looking at it uh, on the uh, on Friday, and if interesting, uh, we could uh, take it up again uh, next week when we we'll go into the next uh, session, which will be about coffee contracts and uh, contracting contract negotiations. And the last one will be about uh, logistics, both local logistics, logistics in general, and uh, as uh, export logistics. Is this clear? Are these questions clear? What the idea is? Any Next week, we'll present you some questions on contracting. Contracts. Now we do it every uh, week. No comments? No questions? Crystal clear, or you didn't understand it? No. So, uh, are, you, are you going? You going to send? It? You going to send the recording to us? Yes, the the presentation will be circulated among you, but you can also uh, see the recording of this. So, like uh, John, some others who uh, reported that they had problems with the the internet. It's not just a presentation, but you can also uh, look at, at, at how what the explanation I gave to it. It makes it easier to understand. Okay, so, uh, what I see from the comments. How you want to do that? What I see from the comments is that uh, the questions are clear. Yes. Mm, 
That's the comment from Lazarus Wambale. Now, the, you, we are going to send these slides to your emails. But what we also expect is that uh, we want feedback from, by Thursday evening. The business advisors in the respective regions are going to be co contacting you directly. Okay, fine. And then by Thursday, you, you submit all those uh, answers that you have for those questions to the business advisors in your regions. They'll be contacting you through email, even by phone contact, so that we consolidate them by Friday morning. Friday evening, we are having a discussion with you, sending all the answers back so that we can prepare very well for the coming uh, webinar next week on Tuesday, same time, and then we can start with the responses that the different participants have given us. I think that is okay with everyone, right? So the Inspector General of Government, they don't, <laughs> they are not saying that's where they don't want to be there. It's because I was on the board of this. Yes, there is a comment. Hope this time we get them because we didn't have we didn't have them last time. Exavia is too late. No, it's them. Exavia, all these are coming to your emails. If at all you think your email is not here, please say, type it right now so that we send it and we include it in the contact list. If at all, that's what I'm saying. We don't want it. Email we, want. we need okay. ten. We usually send to the cooperative emails, but if you want individual emails, you can also send. Okay. 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 Exavia, I think you have something to say. Yes, Roger Sima, I'm seeing it. Oh. you make it. Huh? Janet, unmute your mic. Sorry, 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 sorry. We are getting feedback. Unless you have something to say, please. there is another there is a question coming up from Alice Yes. Uh, once again, thank you so much for this overview. Would you state that this is a good time for someone who is starting an export business this year? How would you? This year compared to last year, given that we are having a high production from the lockdown, so many people are starting businesses in coffee, would it be good to invest this year? It's always a good or a bad year, it depends on, on what you do. There's an opportunity there, always. It depends upon you. I always state that if you want to start exporting, 80% of the work is done before you start exporting which is about quality control, which is about lo your uh, logistics. We want to talk about that. It's about understanding the market, etc. And then you start one container to containers to start learning. Uh, and you need to create a staff for that. You need a team for that. It can be a very small team, but you need to learn to, to do that. And I would always, in the beginning, do in parallel exports and local sales. Local sales you're much more familiar with 
it also helps you to spread the risk. Don't put all your uh, eggs in one basket. Try to, to, to develop it. On the other hand, if you not export, much more difficult to seize all kinds of opportunities that there are in the market. It's, it's much more limited what you can do in Uganda than what you can do if you go abroad. And it's it's not 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 impossible. There are so many organizations. I know even very small organizations, different parts of the world, who learn and they do successfully. I've also seen quite a lot of disaster. So it's mainly about business based common sense. And if you need any kind of support, please contact me. I'm most willing to do that. And there are others in the Uganda that can also help you already have their next sure that a lot of people are experienced. I jump off his young Okay. At the same time, there is a link for the survey that was created. We shall expect some feedback. For the ADC. Excuse me, Wilbur. Excuse me, Wilbur. Excuse me, Wilbur. Yes, please. Uh, uh, with me, there is a question I'm getting from my colleagues I'm seated with. Okay, you can raise it, please. So, thank you, Josh, for the presentation, plus the team at ADC. But well, there is some some bit of like suggestion. Uh, we are like we are like saying, is there any way, like Josh is saying, is ready to assist uh, these produce organizations or farm organizations? Is there any way of like trying to see how he can assist in like giving highlights of like what the market trends are, maybe during the season or towards the season? Oh, okay. yeah, that it can always be up to date. It can either be through ADC, as a, as as mean like some some organization that is 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 coordinating all this, so yeah, that all these different producer organizations are like given highlights of what is happening in the market, so that at their own time they can sit as 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 different committees like business committees to possibly come up with the decisions and where they don't like get a clear picture of what they are working on, then they can always consult back just for some advice or guidance. Mm -hmm. Can that be possible? Um, yes. Um, there are different ways. In the case of uh, Latin America, what I do is I publish a blog every uh, two weeks. I used yes. to do that also for uh, Africa, but they stopped the, the program. There wasn't that much interest. As that's that was what I'm saying. Funded by, by the Progreso Foundation in those days. That's something yeah, we can look into. Either Progreso or uh, Rabobank, Bank, when, whether they are willing to, to uh, finance. And another way of doing it is on a more uh, direct uh, basis. What I do with a number of organizations, they communicate over Skype with a question okay. and I try to answer it as, as soon as possible. But then it's just a few uh, tips. Look yes, at, that look at still that. be okay. And, then, and then that's that's always possible. If you want my uh, Skype, it's Jos Algra. Just my first and last name. And, and you communicate. And, and, and I, I always try to answer as soon as possible when I can, if I've got some time available. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, then, like you said, we can always organize for that. That's good. Yes. Thank you, Jos. Good. More questions or comments? Maybe. Maybe also to add on what Janet is suggesting. Going forward as the ADC, we are going to see how more, we are going to design more follow-up activities, especially for this course or for this module going forward for this year. 
for the different produce organizations so that we can have more of a hands-on support to the produce organizations, not only from the ADC, but also with yours. And I think uh, that will come through as we are going forward this year to make it even more better than having it twice, beginning of the season and the end. That's what is in the pipeline at the moment. Okay. If there are no other questions. Where well, I, I wanted to follow. Yes. I, I was building on the, the question that, that has just been raised. Uh, I was also saying that if the information was there, we need it weekly or at worst by weekly, especially from the beginning of the season, because if it shows us the market differentials, the trend of the market, it can buy, guide us on our buying strategy because at times the, we are not able to continuously uh, have full access to the market. So you, you, John, you're asking for a kind of market report every yes. two weeks, a short one. Yeah, like the one you are sending, but if it can come on weekly basis, it would be good. It shows us the differential, the trend of the market. So that one helps us to also see where we can, how we can price our commodity. You talk more about the, the, the differential references that have been circulating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I stopped doing it because it's, it's more and more difficult to get them and I hardly got any reactions to them, but I'm, I'm most willing to take it up again if you're really interested. I've been a good user, although I was silent, but they would help me also to set the differentials for different buyers. I've been following them too. <coughs> I'll forward some market reports to you. You can look at them. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Alfred. Alfred, are you raising a question? No. We are getting feedback from your side. You didn't unmute. Okay. Anybody with the last question as we close down? We have four minutes. Yes, please, Janet. Uh, just to help other groups get it clear about our questions. The questions Jos has given us. Come again. Just to help our groups get it clearly on the, the questions given by Jos. When when they are they are they are they are I mean like bringing in back the answers on Thursday this week, Friday yes. Thursday. Yes. Yes. This week. Yes. And we are sending them right now after we close. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Okay. 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 Thank you. And uh, I hope to meet all of you again next week. Thank you, Wilbur. Thank you, yours. Okay. Bye. This, this is bye. this is to remind you that uh, Tuesday next week, sometime we are having another session. Please, we we book in early. We log in early. And uh, for those who are to send the feedback questions, please, <laughs> uh, feedback homework, let's do it in time. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Bye.
So they train in leadership and governance. to cooperative, Arabia, more smart more management. Huh? So ABC is agro business development center. They assist businesses to be hope. Is funded by Rabo Bank. Bank. The Progresso is funded by Rabo Bank. So we are sister organizations. You get it. The sister organization. So so training is our ABC. So we have a touch the progress. We can have an auto Yeah, I'm going to go to the 